don't wear a tinfoil hat and plug my ears, but when I do, it is to talk about the new apostolic reformation. Today, I made an exception though. I took off my tinfoil hat, I unplugged my ears, and I even came out of my parents' basement so I could read some books pertaining to the NAR and to search online and doing some more due diligence regarding this movement. All jokes aside, and you will understand why I'm being a bit tongue-in-cheek here in a bit, I wanted to share some things with you about the New Apostolic Reformation. I feel like I may be beating a dead horse, but if this carcass needs more striking, I'm going to pick up a stick and do so. If I was a true prophet, I would be resurrecting this dead horse, but I think you're going to find today that it is alive and well, and it is not speculation, exaggeration, nor is it from someone who enjoys saying a scary term like NAR. Uh, actually, I don't like to sound like a pirate. What has spawned this response, you may ask? Well, this may help. The torch has now been passed to the heresy-hunting evangelicals who have not only kept the conspiracy theory alive, they've actually taken it to a whole new level. And maybe you wonder why. Well, that's the second part of this whole thing, the charismatic connection. And this part is pretty easy to understand. These evangelical heresy hunters have always hated charismatics. Why? Well, a lot of it, I think, just boils down to jealousy. Even Jesus, the Bible tells us, was delivered up by the Pharisees because of jealousy. And it's not difficult to understand why they're jealous. All of the biggest movements in the world are charismatic. Popular worship music is all charismatic. Most of the large churches in the world are charismatic. There's energy and excitement and fruit in the charismatic camp. And meanwhile, the critics sit there in their boring, depressing, dying churches, and they're jealous. But what's more, charismatics expose their spiritual bankruptcy. Because you see, if what the charismatics are experiencing is indeed authentic, then what does it say about the critics? Well, it makes them look really bad. It makes it look like they're missing something really important. And so rather than repent and seek God, it's a lot easier just to attack charismatics, accuse them of heresy, and claim that everything they're doing is counterfeit Christianity. That way you can feel better about yourself and save face in front of your friends without having to change the very attitudes and doctrines that keep you unfruitful, miserable, and critical. Now, this NAR narrative gave the critics a wonderful gift because instead of just painting the charismatic movement as heretical and unorthodox as they've been doing for years, now they could also make it seem diabolical and nefarious. And so they took over all of those leftist talking points, added a few of their own, made a few new guilt by association connections, and there you have it. Stick with me today as we listen to clips and we examine some literature pertaining to the New Apostolic Reformation. You don't want to miss this entire episode. Hi there, and welcome to the Love Six Scribe podcast, where we talk about biblical truths, current topics, and where we grow in loving the Word and loving the one who is the Word, Jesus Christ. I am Dawn Hill, and I am the Love Six Scribe. About a year ago, Daniel Kalinda recorded a podcast titled, What is the NAR and Am I a Part of It? Now, I'm not going to speculate on Kalinda himself. The focus of this episode will deal with the first part of his title, What is the NAR? However, what was bothersome about this episode was the rhetoric coming from him regarding this movement and the generalizations made about those who speak of its existence while spouting ad hominem attacks and either getting some facts wrong or avoiding them altogether. He also stated in a recent podcast episode about apostles that the NAR is a conspiracy theory created by liberals and fueled by evangelical heresy hunters. His YouTube thumbnail for the first podcast, What is the NAR and Am I a Part of It?, also seemed to sum up his feelings about this topic because it displayed a man plugging his ears, wearing a tinfoil hat, and dark goggles. In that episode, Kalinda describes the NAR as silly and that those who believe in it liken it to a nefarious cabal. Instead, he believes it is pure and simple nonsense, containing some truth with little facts and on par with claims of the Illuminati. Daniel says those who speak of the NAR in a critical way are evangelical heresy hunters and use the term NAR because it sounds scary to say NAR. Which, like I said, I don't say that. I know some people do. That's a personal preference. I say NAR or New Apostolic Reformation. He states opponents do not know what they are talking about. He does state that it is not an organization, which we would agree on that statement. It is not a card-carrying organization. It is, though, a movement which Wagner coined the term for, and he stated numerous times this very thing in writing and speech. And that that movement ushered in the second apostolic age. 
One of Kalinda's references used was a 2011 article Wagner wrote for Charisma, which he states is the time this conspiracy theory concerning NAR was formulated. Now, he's going. he played a lot, which I'm not going to do that today. He played some longer clips from an NPR program back in 2011 that had to do with uh, the political area and the liberal news media and that they latched onto this and because of the political scene that they made much to do about nothing regarding the NAR and attributed this, of course, to Peter Wagner and some other political figures. And then it kind of seemed to die down and fizzle out. And his argument is that essentially stirred up this conspiracy theory that um, heresy hunters and those that are opponents to this uh, movement and have concerns about it because of the aberrant practices that are going on within this type of movement that people loosely affiliate themselves with. And sometimes they won't use that term, but nonetheless, they do. And the whole foundation of the core belief of the New Apostolic Reformation, which we will get into momentarily. But this is where he he argues this from. It's a conspiracy theory, and it's based on what the liberal media said. Therefore, the 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 deduction is, which I find it very ironic in his in his episode, he accuses people of making ad hominem attacks, but then he does that himself. So anyway, he basically tells those that are lumped in that category of evangelical heresy hunters that they are basically adopting the liberal media's attack against Christians. So I want to talk about this article a little bit because I actually have this article printed right in front of me, and I have read the article that C. Peter Wagner wrote for Charisma in 2011. I also have in my possession multiple books pertaining to the New Apostolic Reformation, Apostles and Prophets, Apostolic Governance, Apostolic Networks, and other sources to cite not only Peter Wagner's books, there are many other books to cite, by the way. There are many other sources to cite. Daniel Kalender reads from a portion of this article from Wagner in his NAR episode. This article was written in part to address the liberal media's claims about political figures in the NAR. This is the area from which Kalenda will use to align anyone who states concerns about the NAR, I'm not going to give attention to the political aspect and what the liberal media did, because frankly, the use of this to generalize everyone opposing this movement is a red herring. This is the portion he read. The term New Apostolic Reformation was coined by Peter Wagner, and he explained what he meant quite thoroughly in that Charisma magazine article that I mentioned earlier. Let me just read an excerpt from that. He says, quote, the NAR is not an organization. No one can join or carry a card. It has no leader. I've been called the founder, but that is not the case. One reason I might be seen as an intellectual godfather is that I might have been the first to observe the movement, give a name to it, and describe its characteristics as I saw them. When this began to come together through my research in 1993, I was professor of church growth at Fuller Theological Seminary, where I taught for 30 years. The roots of the NAR go back to the beginning of the African Independent Church Movement in 1900, the Chinese House Church Movement beginning in 1976, and the U.S. Independent Charismatic Movement beginning in the 1970s, and the Latin American Grassroots Church Movement beginning around the same time. I was neither the founder nor a member of any of these movements. I was simply a professor who observed that they were the fastest growing churches in their respective regions and that they had a number of common characteristics. If I was going to write about this phenomenal move of the Holy Spirit, I knew I had to give a name to it. I tried post-denominational, but soon dropped it because of the objections of many of my friends who were denominational executives. Then, in 1994, I tested New Apostolic Reformation. Reformation because the movement matched the Protestant Reformation in world impact. Apostolic because of all of the changes, the most radical one was apostolic governance, which I'll explain in due time. And new because several other churches and denominations already carried the name apostolic, but they did not fit the NAR pattern. Other names of this movement, which are more or less synonymous with NAR, have been neo-Pentecostal, neo-charismatic, independent, or non-denominational. I'm rather fascinated at the lists of individuals whom the media glibly connects with the NAR. I'm sure that some of them wouldn't even recognize the term. In many cases, however, they would fit the NAR template, but since the NAR has no membership list, they themselves would need to say whether they consider themselves affiliated, end quote. He skipped around in the article, so that's not the entire article. What Kalinda did not do was read the two preceding paragraphs and then another one in the middle as far as talking about the New Apostolic Reformation. So I wanted to read some of those to kind of fill in a little bit of holes, if I may. 
So what is the NAR? This is under the subheading for this article that he wrote, that C. Peter Wagner wrote. NAR is definitely not a cult. Those who affiliate with it believe the Apostles' Creed and all the standard classic statements of Christian doctrine. NAR embraces the largest non-Catholic segment of global Christianity, the fastest growing segment and the only segment of Christianity currently growing faster than the world population and faster than Islam. Christianity is booming now in the global south, which includes sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and large parts of Asia. Most of the new churches in the global south, including many denominational ones, would comfortably fit the NAR template. NAR represents the most radical change in the way of doing church since the Protestant Reformation. This is not a doctrinal change. We adhere to the major tenets of the Reformation, the authority of Scripture, justification by faith, and the priesthood of all believers. But the quality of church life, the governance of the church, the worship, the theology of prayer, the missional goals, the optimistic vision for the future, and other features constitute quite a change from traditional Protestantism. And to skip down below uh, the first paragraph that Kalinda read, he says, NAR has no official statements of theology or ecclesiology, although a large number of us do happen to agree upon many somewhat radical conclusions. Most of us have long track records of service within traditional Christianity, and we have needed to go through paradigm shifts to get where we are now. Keep in mind that one of the effects of every paradigm shift is opposition. One reason for the opposition to some of the more radical ideas of NAR is that certain people have decided not to change, and they are upset with those who have. And he also does address some concerns about NAR. There's some groups, uh, subheadings that he has under this, such as apostolic governance and the office of prophet, dominionism, theocracy, extra biblical revelation, supernatural signs and wonders, and relational structures. Um, he did talk about under, for example, supernatural signs and wonders. He said one critic claimed that NAR has an excessive fixation on Satan and demonic spirits. This is purely a judgment call, and it may only mean that we cast out more demons than they do. So what? It would seem those paragraphs matter because of what Kalinda proceeds to say a little later on in the podcast. So first, the New Apostolic Reformation is, as I just outlined, the way that Peter Wagner, a professor, was categorizing a trend in church history for academic purposes. And again, this was a purely academic issue, honestly quite irrelevant to anything in the real world. I mean, Wagner's observations might have been valid and even interesting, but by his own admission, Wagner didn't start any of these movements. He didn't lead any of these movements. He wasn't even a member of any of these movements. He was just an observer trying to give them a name for academic purposes. Okay, so that's the first and original way that NAR terminology was used. So he says it was purely an academic issue as far as Wagner was concerned. That's not true. Wagner said numerous times in his writing that as of 2001, we had entered the second apostolic age. I took the time to research into books affiliated with Wagner, even those he wrote forwards for. And I want to look at those. But first, let's listen to Wagner himself teaching on beliefs such as dominionism in relation to the topic of the New Apostolic Reformation. Satan, let me just read this so I get the wording right. Satan has been losing ground for 2,000 years. But prophetically, the process is about to speed up. Now I say this, Satan will lose more ground in the next hundred years than he lost in the past 2000. It's probably conservative prophecy, but I think that's going to happen. In the, as I mentioned, we, the year 2001 opened the second apostolic age. The government of the church is now in place. We're aligning with apostles and prophets. And this, th this war that we're in, that we have talked about, has two fronts. It has a spiritual front. And it has a natural front. And um, in the spiritual front, it says we must stand against the wiles of the devil. What are the wiles of the devil? The wiles of the devil are anything that he does to maintain the dominion that he, that he stole from Adam in the Garden of Eden. That's the spiritual front. But we better not stay there. We better bring it down to the natural front. And that's what all the dancing us as Robert's going to talk about. We're going to talk about bringing it to earth. And this is the new cutting edge for this generation. God is revealing powerful concepts for us, which I don't have time to explain. Some of you will know what I'm talking about. And if you don't, you're going to hear about them real soon. Or get my book um, called Dominion. And he's also given us revelation of the crucial role of wealth. We will not see sustained transformation of cities or nations without controlling vast amounts of kingdom 
well, those are carefully chosen statements, vast amounts of kingdom wealth. We're going to come back to that book, Dominion, in just a few minutes, because I have something to share with you on that. And we'll also come back to some clips in just a a few minutes. But here are some statements from Wagner's writing I want to look at, because I took some time to look at books. I had books already. I've covered some other things in in a previous podcast about apostolic governance and if it's a myth or not. But we're going to look at some other books today, just some, some little excerpts. So we've already discussed in another episode, The Apostolic Governance, about Cheon's book published in 2019 called Modern Day Apostles, where he affirms the teachings of Peter Wagner and acknowledges the New Apostolic Reformation as a current movement. Now, Cheon was mentored by C. Peter Wagner, not to mention, I keep hearing <laughs> these things that said, well, I ask so-and-so, which we never know who exactly they're asking, but I asked so-and-so who's a well-known leader because they're supposed to be in the NAR, and I asked them if, the, if they're in the NAR, and they say, well, what's that? And I find that very interesting, depending on who they're asking, because there are very well-known people, Bill Johnson, Chris Valentin, Robert Henderson, Patricia King, um, several people that endorsed Shayon's book. Bill Johnson even wrote the foreword for it. So did he not read it to see that it actually contained talk about the New Apostolic Reformation in it? I mean, that's the question that I have. If, if, if he is saying, I don't know what it is, which again, we'll get to that. <laughs> we have a lot of stuff to cover in this episode today, and I hope that you're going to find it helpful in understanding this a little bit more. So we know about this book from 2019 with Cheon. And he said these things and affirmed what C. Peter Wagner said. And I came across another book written by a man named Greg Wallace, who was commissioned by Cheyenne as an apostle. The book was also written in 2019, and it is called Apostolic Governance in the 21st Century. Cheyenne endorsed it with a foreword. Wallace cited several other apostles in his book, including Peter Wagner. One of the things he cited was a PowerPoint presentation released by Glory of Zion in 2012, which is the ministry that Chuck Pierce presides over as an apostle. Uh, The PowerPoint presentation was released to that ministry by Peter Wagner, and it was called Apostolic Centers. Now, the link that is provided in the bibliography of Wallace's book no longer works in the citation. It took you to Glory of Zion. However, I did find it in a search engine. On one slide, Chuck Pierce is quoted as saying on June 29th, 2012, Quote, this is a time to break out of the shell of our last identity, whether good or bad. God is doing a new thing with his people and creating a new model of kingdom authority on earth. You are part of this. A slide noting the difference between pastors and apostles stated, if the focus is on the church, the pastor is an employee. Pastors can be hired and fired. Pastors support the church. And and pastor tenure is two to ten years. The, if the focus is on the kingdom, this is what was listed under that um, column. The apostle is the leader. Apostles cannot be hired or fired. Apostolic centers support the apostle. And apostolic tenure equals lifetime. Another slide stated the apostle is aligned with with another apostle and is accountable to him or her. In fairness, Wallace does have a chapter about an apostle having an accountability team. He also states the concerns critics have of apostles and abuse of authority, which he says is not likely to happen. Uh, And it's not always true, saying that a team should be formed comprised of members outside the apostolic center who are peer fivefold members and or spiritual parents to the presiding apostle. Also, he noted that in that section, as far as accountability teams, when forming those, it was important to remember and to recognize the amount of God-given authority that is vested in the lead apostle without blindly acquiescing to it. And this is where he says the accountability team comes into play. Some other books to note. Apostolic Centers, written by Alan Karen, written in 2014. In the foreword by Wagner, Peter Wagner states, quote, Since we have entered into the second apostolic age, God has begun to bring forth several additional new seasons. One of them is the phenomenon of certain traditional local churches transitioning into what are being called apostolic centers. My guess in North America is that it would be in the hundreds and perhaps even move into the thousands. It is a movement of the Holy Spirit that must not be ignored by church leaders. The major innovation is to move from pastoral government to apostolic government. That means moving from the old wineskins. That's a very common term. I heard this quite a bit in the years that I was in the church I was part of. And there was a switch from pastoral government to apostolic government, it would seem, based on what I sat under. But I heard much about alignment, authority, apostolic, um, prophetic, fivefold, 
old wine skins, new wine skins, you know, all that type of, of jargon. Um, so he says that means moving from the old wine skins of democratic church government, where the final authority is an elected board of elders or deacons, or in some cases, a vote of the entire congregation. The pastor serves at the pleasure of the decision making group and consequently is an employee of the church. The new wine skin invests the final authority in the apostle. The apostle is no longer an employee, but the equivalent of president and CEO. Wagner, Wagner says he is determined to repeat two axioms on as many platforms as he possibly can until further notice because they form the heart of understanding the new apostolic reformation and the second apostolic age. The first one is this. We are now witnessing the most radical shift in the way of doing church since the Protestant Reformation. And the second of all the changes, the most radical one is the delegation of authority by the Holy Spirit to individuals. Remember this that I just said, because you will hear him do this very thing from a platform in a little while further in this podcast. A book titled Revival Hubs Rising by Jennifer LeClaire and Ryan Lestrange cites Chuck Pierce in the first several pages, stating, quote, the apostolic centers or freedom outposts will be known as contending governmental influences, very much like in John the Baptist, Jesus and the Apostles Day, end quote. They say in their book that revival hubs are the new wineskin, or better to call a resurrection of the original model of church that is clearly presented in the book of Acts. They mention Peter Wagner as starting a network of apostolic centers nationally and globally. There are other books available. I'm going to list them to you right now. Apostolic Centers by um, Salka, S-A-W-K-A. Apostles 101 by Jonathan Ferguson, from, printed from, uh, published in 2017. Apostolic Architecture by Ronald Cottle published in 2017. Apostolic Expansion by Alan Karen and Chuck Pierce, published in 2019. Apostolic Church Rising by Chuck Pierce from 2015. Folding Five Ministry into One Powerful Team, Taking the Apostolic and Prophetic Reformation to the Next Powerful Level by Ben Peters. This was published in 2011. Apostolic Teams, Penetrating the Nations by Sam Matthews. He references Wagner in this book as well. This was published in 2020. Kingdom Centers and Emerging Ecclesia by Greg Crawford, published in 2012 with Wagner's endorsement. Understanding the Kingdom of God by Hector Torres, published in 2021 and containing a foreword from Peter Wagner. I'm not sure if this was a reprint because Peter Wagner passed away in 2016. So nonetheless, it, this may have been a revision or an updated version of it, but he included a foreword from Peter Wagner in it, and that book came out in 2021. The Final Reformation and Great Awakening by Bill Hammond, published in 2021, again with a foreword from Peter Wagner. So that may be a reprint as well. Does this all sound like Wagner's observations and naming a movement were merely academic in nature? I'll let you ponder on that for just a minute. While you're pondering that, we're going to get back to some clips. So at the one hour, 25 minute mark, Daniel Kalinda says this about the NAR and Peter Wagner. Now, here's where confusion might come in. You can read Peter Wagner's books and you can see how he's talking about this thing called the New Apostolic Reformation. Then you see how at one point he had several hundred quote unquote apostles that were quote unquote aligned under him. Whoa, hold on. We got to pump the brakes right there and we need to talk about something for just a minute. You can't just gloss over that and and keep on going. So let's let's talk about this. He uses these air quotes, quote unquote apostles that are quote unquote aligned under him. It's interesting because when you look on the current ICAL leader site, it used to be called the International Coalition of Apostles. They changed it after Peter Wagner died to the International Coalition of Apostolic Leaders. These people believe that they are apostles. There are no air quotes or scare quotes around them. In fact, on their website, as I'm looking right now, under the membership section, ICAL's definition of an apostle says the name apostle is a new testament word the apostle paul described as a person who serves in the office that jesus established at his ascension and they quote ephesians 4 11 and 12 and he himself gave some to be apostles some prophets some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry for the edifying of the body of of christ they go on to say an apostle is defined by ical as a christian leader gifted taught commissioned and sent by god 
with the authority to establish the foundational government of a church or business within an assigned sphere by hearing what the Holy Spirit is saying and one who sets things in order accordingly for the growth and maturity of the group or complex of groups. And in parentheses, they have churches or businesses. They go on to say, since apostolic leaders operate in several different ways, ICAL is open to vertical apostolic leaders, including ecclesiastical, functional, congregational, and team members vertical apostles to horizontal apostolic leaders, including convening, ambassadorial, mobilizing, and territorial horizontal apostolic leaders, and to different kinds of, quote, marketplace apostles. These are all terms that Peter Wagner used in his books for years. This is all based on his teaching, vertical apostleship, horizontal apostleship, marketplace apostles. It goes on to say, ICAL members are relational and accountable to one another. They do say that they do not ordain or commission apostles here and that it's not a covering agency and it should not be considered the primary accountability agent for any of its members. They do say that. If you go in and scroll down the page on the membership section, it says membership in ICAL primarily comes through being an active member of one's own national coalition. It is the goal of ICAL to have a national coalition in every nation of the earth. I'm going to highlight that and and the whole apostolic center thing because I'm going to play a clip for you a little later on. And um, it's going to have a little bit of Peter Wagner in it and then Dutch Sheets. So you can kind of get a feel for why some people are concerned when they hear this type of talk. And I'm not talking about secular people. I'm talking born-again believing Christians that are disturbed by the fact that there are people saying that you have to be under an apostle, that you have to um, submit to their governing authority, that you have to acknowledge that there's been a restoration of, of, of apostles and prophets today, just like there was in the first century church. Otherwise, you you don't have the Holy Spirit or you're not going to be under a covering or you're going to miss the new wine. Um, there is a membership fee that you have to pay in order to be part of ICAL. The individual membership is $350 a, um, a year, and the married apostolic couple, you, um, you get to do $450. So you get a little bit of a break. And the fees do not include conference registration. Now, I'm going to interject something, one other thing here real quick, and then we're going to keep playing Daniel Kalinda's clip. It is not uncommon for apostolic networks to charge to be part of it. Um, the one that was affiliated with the ministry I was part of, there was an annual fee you had to pay. And this network was for establishing an apostolic alignment for existing ministers and ministries to enable the body of Christ to be fully edified and equipped to advance the kingdom. This is straight from their actual network um, information that they handed out to people for them to be aware of what the expectations were, what the function was, what the mandate was. But notice how they say this is an apostolic alignment and that um, there was a need to return to foundational leadership truths and God was raising up an increasing awareness of apostolic ministry. Now, when you go on to look at the two levels of alignment that they list under their heading, which is actually says that two levels of alignment. They offer two unique levels of involvement and alignment within their network, and this stuff may have changed since then. This is several years old. It says, we value apostolic relationships and the powerful effect that they have in expanding and releasing kingdom ministry. Now, in this network, I can uh, verify there I was in attendance and services where members were actually commissioned by the apostle I was under. They were commissioned in, in this network. So to be affiliated with that, there were two different levels of alignment. The first one was a junior member. This was a minister who had aligned with the network to receive apostolic counsel, instruction, and impartation. Those members were loosely aligned and may be in fellowship with other variety of other networks, but receive a measure of strength from this network, and they would be invited to gatherings and receive teaching from the leaders of this network. They were required to pay an annual membership fee, and they were encouraged to sow as they could and as God directed them. The other level of alignment was called a senior member. A minister who is fully aligned with this network as the primary apostolic voice in their life and ministry. This individual is considered a son or daughter of the senior apostle. They are eligible for commissioning slash ordination and their ministry is apostolically aligned with the, with the apostolic network and the ministry of this apostle. They will receive teaching, invitations to events, personal counsel slash advice from this apostle or key team members as needed. They're expected to support the events of that apostolic network and the ministry of that apostle um, as, as they can. In addition to the annual membership fee, the 
churches slash ministries aligned with this network were expected to sow a portion of their increase into the network as recognition of their apostolic relationship. Ministers are expected to sow monthly from their ministries into that network. So I don't know if that's unique to to other networks and also to whether or not I'm not going to speculate, although I could, whether or not being called a son or daughter had to do with your financial giving. I don't know. You can draw your own conclusions from that. But it's not uncommon for apostolic networks to not only require a registration fee yearly, but to also um, make it a point that you are expected to give every month. You are expected to tithe from your ministry to that apostolic network. And this is a way of showing that you are loyal and that you're honoring that apostle. So with that, we're going to keep moving on through Daniel Kalinda's clip. But I just wanted to interject and share those things with you to give some food for thought. And then sometimes you see how he was hobnobbing with some really well-known charismatic leaders. And then you hear what the media is saying about this thing called the NAR. And it's confirmed by people you might think are credible evangelical voices. Like maybe for some of you, John MacArthur. And everything seems to check out. But then, on the other hand, you hear people like me and Dr. Michael Brown and Bill Johnson. And basically everybody saying, we aren't a part of something called the NAR. Or in some cases, as it was for me, what's the NAR? I never even heard of it. And you might think... We must be the ones that are trying to hide something. So what's going on? Well, it's pretty simple. Yes, Peter Wagner coined the term New Apostolic Reformation and wrote about it in several books and preached about it because in his mind, that terminology was a good way of categorizing the largest and most diverse and most influential swath of Christendom the world has ever known. But that was Wagner's terminology. It was his category. The people that Wagner was describing would have identified as charismatics or Pentecostals or non-denominational, or as part of one of countless independent church movements, and so on. They never agreed on the terminology, or joined an organization, or signed on to some statement of faith, or even knew that it existed. I think these critics have vastly overestimated Peter Wagner's influence. He says that he believes Wagner's influence has been uh, overestimated, um, and basically exaggerated or blown out of proportion, if you will. But what's interesting is his statement about Wagner not being that influential, um, doesn't really coincide with this clip that I also found, which is two different clips put together. So let's have a listen to that for just a little bit. Okay, now, they're, 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 uh, the first, first of all, I want to repeat something. You don't have to write it down because you already have it in your notes. But I want to remind you that the new apostolic reformation is the most radical change in the way of doing church since the Protestant Reformation. That's what we're, that's what we're dealing with. That's what we're springing off into the 21st century with. And um, well, one thing that I, uh, that I want everybody to understand... <laughs> If this sounds redundant because you've heard it before and heard me say it, it's because I want to reiterate the fact that he made this very clear. This is the fastest growing movement in the world of the group of people. And he's going to expound on this here as he's, as he's talking in this lecture about the new apostolic reformation. And global awakening is a part of this. And I'm not trying to say this arrogantly, but I'm trying to, to, for us to get the movement of the spirit of God um, in the world today. And that is that what the Spirit of God is bringing about in the New Apostolic Reformation is the largest and the fastest growing block of Christianity around the world. It is, it is very large. Now what we know, we even know more about it now than we did when the World Christian Encyclopedia came out. But in David Barrett and the World Christian Encyclopedia, which was the most intense research project ever done on the World Christian Movement, three volumes, three huge volumes with three columns on each page, I mean huge. But he divides all World Christianity into mega blocks. And um, so there are over 2 billion Christians in the world, but here are the, you won't have time to write all these downs, but just, just, I just want to give you the idea. It's nothing to take notes on. The Roman, you have the Roman Catholic, you have the Anglican or Episcopalian, we call it in America. You have the Orthodox, different branches of the Orthodox Church. You have the Protestant, and this is sometimes called Evangelical as well. And so this is where the Pentecostal, this is where the Assemblies of God would be in this one of David Barrett's mega blocks. And then you have the, the marginal Christians, which I, I, tend to leave out because this is the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons and the, the that kind of cult, what we think is cultic. But he concludes it in the whole thing. And then you have the independent or post, he, he hasn't, Jack Hayford hasn't seen this yet. <laughs> he still calls it post-denominational, neo-apostolic, that's the word, at, new apostolic. And um, he has that. Now, if you look at these, naturally the Roman Catholic is the biggest mega block, but then you'll notice that this, um, uh, the, the, what I would call, I call no, or neo, that's new, apostolic uh, is the largest non 
Catholic mega block in the world. And this is as of about 10 years ago. It's more now. It's, it's, the, uh, the, uh, the updated statistics are more than that now. And, and of all the mega blocks, including the Catholic, the new apostolic is the only mega block growing faster than the world population and faster than Islam. What I'm getting ready to play next is a clip from a conference. I don't know what the year was from what he just said or from this conference, but this was a conference where uh, Cindy Jacobs is introducing Peter Wagner. So we're going to listen to her introduce him and you can draw your own conclusions as far as how influential you think Peter Wagner was from then until now as far as the movement and charismatic and apostolic prophetic and, and what have you. I say this every time, but it's so true. It is my privilege to introduce Dr. C. Peter Wagner, my mentor, the father to so many of us Christian leaders in the world, and so also myself, many people that God has allowed us to go around the world. He has written 72 books that are in languages across the face of the earth. He has started whole movements. I could name movement after movement. He has a gift of when Christian leaders are not being received. He just stands alongside of them. I'm talking about some of the best known leaders. He's very, very good friends has, uh, with uh, leaders like, like Dr. Cho. And I, I could go on and on and on. And Peter, you can't hear this part, but I think there's a book written on the 360 something most influential people in the whole world, in the whole world, not Christian leaders. And he is in that book. Amen. And so we are so honored. He's the founding president of Global Harvest Ministries and Network Strategic Groups of Apostles, Providence, Deliverance Ministries, and Educators to equip the body of Christ through conferences, seminars, literature, and other media. He serves as the chancellor of the Wagner Leadership Institute with seven schools in the U.S. Oh, this has got to be old. There's many, many schools around the world. Maybe you want to talk about that. He has he invited John Wimber to come to Fuller Theological Seminary that began a movement of healing that is mainstreamed across the face of the earth. We are privileged and we are honored. I want you to stand up to receive one of the mightiest men of God on the face of the earth, Dr. Peter Wagner. So, it doesn't sound like he had a whole lot of influence, does it? Okay, so we'll, we'll move on. <laughs> and now, I also came across this teaching from Peter Wagner regarding the NAR. And clips with him, again, are few and far between online. Um, but I did find this full teaching he did in 2015 at a conference held by Jeff Jansen. Some people may know that name. Jeff Jansen is a self-professing prophet. And Jeff held a conference at his church, and it was called Arise and Shine, Spirit Fall. One of the other speakers in attendance during this teaching was Dutch Sheets. I actually found a, um, article, a short article for this on Elijah List, and it, was, it even had the banner on it and had the picture of the speaker. So Dutch Sheets was there. I know that he was even in this meeting where uh, Peter Wagner was speaking because at one point during the service, Peter Wagner says Dutch's name and is talking to him from the, pl the platform. So I want you to listen to some of these clips. There's going to be several of them here. I'm going to take little excerpts from this service because it was almost an hour and a half long. But Peter Wagner is sharing some things that you're probably going to, it's going to be a repeat of some of the things you heard. But I want you to remember what we talked about a few minutes ago, that he said that he was going to take every opportunity he could until until further notice to say these things from the platform. And that was the two things that he highlighted that he stressed about the that this was the next reformation uh, beside the Protestant Reformation and that it was the most radical way of doing church and that it was a shift in the authority to individuals. So let's listen to some clips from this teaching that he did in 2015 at the Arise and Shine Spirit Fall Conference that Jeff Jansen hosted. Part of the nature of God is here in Daniel 2. Well, you kept talking about Daniel 2.22. I'm going to talk about Daniel 2.20 and 21. Yeah. Let's go together. It says, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for the wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the seasons. Who changes them? God changes them. In other words, part of the nature of God is not to get stuck in one time or season, but to change the times and the seasons. See? So that's what we have to, this we have to latch on to. And in every new season, God gives new wine. Yeah, amen. But the new wine in every season always needs new wineskins. And Jesus taught about this, uh, new wineskins and old wineskins. So anyway, where we are now is that... 
Now, I want to stop there for just a second, and I want to interject something, because I looked up the the passage where he's talking about the wineskins and it was in relation to when the pharisees and the, and the disciple the john's disciples were questioning jesus because his disciples didn't fast and he went on to talk about they don't the disciples don't need to fast the bride doesn't need to fast when the bridegroom is present and then he goes on to talk about these two um pair uh, these two analogies if you will that you don't put um, an unshrunk piece of cloth on an old garment an old tear because it won't hold and then you also don't put new wine and old wine skins because as basically as the the new wine gets to ferment it expands the wine skin and it bursts and so what essentially is going on here when you talk, when you study that out and look at it, Jesus is talking about the new covenant that he brings that is by grace through faith in him alone. And then that's what he's referencing, that there's no need to do all these legalistic things in order to to have God's good graces, if you will, or to demonstrate something. What what he's telling them is that the new covenant through him is coming. And that's what he's alluding to with the wineskin analogy that he uses. But you're going to hear Peter Wagner and lots of other leaders do this. Again, I sat under someone that said that they were an apostle and taught on this at times about the old wineskin, the new wineskin, and the, you know, the religious wineskin is the old wineskin and, you know, all this. So this is nothing, there's nothing new being taught here. It's just being regurgitated and perpetuated. And Wagner was one of them. And so my argument would be is that a lot of people are adopting the things he said, because I've read some of these books and it's the same verbiage, same type and the same concept that's being perpetuated in these, in these books. I believe our old wineskin, for most of us, is denomination. And our new wineskin is the New Apostolic Reformation. I just abbreviated it there. And the new season is here. And I believe the way I can read history is that the Second Apostolic Age began in the year 2001. And it has begun. We're at, what, it would be 14 years now. But many will decide to stay in the old wineskin. God, God bless them. They're good people. They're brothers and sisters in Christ. They're going to go to heaven when they die. Okay? They just won't get any new wine. That's their choice. And, uh, and we'll get the new wine. So apostles, since apostles are new for many people, so if apostles, if apostles are the top leaders, now this is just logical, they, they have tremendous authority. See that word authority? They, they make the final decisions. That's what leadership is. No, it doesn't mean they don't consult. It doesn't mean they don't get a lot of advice. It doesn't mean they, they, they doesn't mean they're autocrats. But they take, they listen to everybody's advice. And who makes the final decision? The apostles make the final uh, decision. Let me let me give you two foundational axioms now for the new apostolic reformation. I'm using a couple of technical terms. The new apostolic reformation, the whole movement that I say we can trace back to about 1900, the second apostolic age here in America, in North America, began in 2001. It began in Africa before this. It actually began in China before this and other places. But um, in, in the, well, as we know it, it began in 2001. So let me give you two foundational axioms of the whole New Apostolic uh, Reformation. Oh, I, before I do that, I wanted to, I, I forgot I had this verse up here. You got that up there, Brandon? Yeah. Uh, it says, I talked about authority. And here's what Paul wrote, because I'm going to come back to this in a few minutes. For even if I should boast somewhat more about our authority, He's writing to the Corinthians, and see that, First, Second Corinthians. Even I should boast more about our authority, which the Lord gave us for edification and not for your destruction. I shall not be ashamed. I shall not be ashamed of what? Of boasting about what? My authority. I've been to some seminars on leadership where the person leading the seminar says, you know, if you have to tell anybody you're their leader, you're not really their leader. But the thing is, the Apostle Paul never went to one of those seminars. <laughs> he didn't just tell them about it, he boasted about it. <laughs> No, I'm coming back to that. that one. <laughs> Here are the two foundational axioms. Now, I'm going to go slow on this if anybody's taking notes. I want to make sure you get this down. And the wording is very important, okay? The New Apostolic Reformation, number one, represents the most radical change in doing church since the Protestant Reformation. The most radical... Now, see that word, doing church? It doesn't mean it's a great change in theology. We believe in the theology of the Reformation, by and large. It's not a big theological change. It's a change in the way of carrying out the life of the church the most radical change in fact i could argue that it's the most radical change in doing church since the first century could you do that yeah yeah but i won't go into that because i don't want to 
That will ruin the night's sleep of the Lutherans. <laughs> okay, number two. Of all the changes, see that is the most radical change, but of all the changes, this is the most radical one. The amount of spiritual authority delegated by the Holy Spirit to individuals. The amount of spiritual authority delegated by the Holy Spirit to individuals. He goes on to talk about what do apostles do. We've got one more clip to play here for you. Number two, what do apostles do? Okay, I'm not going to spend an awful lot of time on this, even though the whole talk could be on this, on this uh, subject. But I'm just going to make a list for you and um, make, maybe, maybe make one or two comments on each one. Um, apostles lead the church. I've, I've, that's what I, everything I said in point number one. Apostles lead the church both <coughs> locally and translocally. Locally, the, the apostles head up their local church if they have one. They don't necessarily have one. And um, then they, they, they lead the church translocally. Get what the word translocally means. It's not just the local thing, but further than the local, through apostolic networks. That's actually apostolic networks are the modern functional substitute for denominations. Now, they operate differently because it's a new season, but we don't have denominations, but apostolic networks like uh, Global Fire Network is one of these functional things. We're going to, tomorrow we're going to commission 30 people, and um, I'm not a prophet, so I shouldn't say things like this, Ron, but I, I, you know, I see Global Fire counting thousands of churches, not just Global Connect, I'm talking about global fire, thousands of churches. This is, this, this is a launching pad right here. Peter Wagner goes on to say that apostles birth, activate gifts in others. They build, they align, they teach. He quoted Acts 2.42 on that. When the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, I've heard that as well. The alluding to uh, devoting yourself to the apostles' teachings, the context of that would be great to understand, by the way, in a biblical sense. Um, they set things in order. He says, apostles' father, they war, they have extraordinary character, they are blameless, they have followers. In a book that he referenced that Alan Karen wrote, that one of the chapters uh, called Apostolic Centers, which I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, he has a chapter in there called The Law of Apostolic Attraction. He continues to reference this book by Alan Karen that came out at the time as well as a book by Chuck Pierce and Robert Heidler about the apostolic, which he recommended both of them to the congregation. He spoke on instances where leaders had to change from a traditional church to an apostolic church, which rang true with me and where I was once affiliated because it wasn't always an apostolic church. It was very much word of faith. And then over the years, it started changing not only in name, but in how it was it identified. It was identified as a hub hub, an apostolic hub or a revival hub. And so, you know, that's that goes back to one of the books that he co-wrote with Jennifer LeClaire about revival hubs and then taking on the apostolic mantle, if you will, or the apostolic identity. I was familiar with this type of teaching and this type of transition from pastoral to apostolic. And this certainly seems to fit <laughs> what C. Peter Wagner taught. So again, uh, to say that he had no influence and that this is not something that's currently ongoing. And I have no idea how many apostolic networks are in the, the United States alone. There's probably hundreds, if not thousands of them, because it seems like every day there's always a new apostle um, and new prophet, by the way, prophets are a dime a dozen and there's new apostles popping up all the time. So I don't know how many networks there are, but nevertheless, people that say anything about this, they're labeled as not having the Holy Spirit, that that they are not hearing from God, that they're attacking God's anointed and on and on. So you're not allowed to question. And so this really, to deny that this is going on, it, it's, um, it's frustrating. It's frustrating to hear people d denigrate people who are calling things into question. I'm not calling for anyone to be burned at the stake. I'm not calling for anyone to be stoned. Um, I don't know of anybody like that, that that's legitimately calling these things out and drawing attention to the aberrant practices that are going on with people that affiliate themselves with this movement. I don't understand why it's not okay to call things into question. I think that that's the thing that's most disturbing to me. I get that there are people that take it too far and that they don't they don't want to see people reconcile back to God, or they don't want to see people repent for false teaching. I get that. But to, but to basically, again, 
be hypocritical and to lump everybody in that category that is saying something contrary to this and saying, hey, this is a real problem. Like this movement is, a, it's, and it's not an organization. I agree with Daniel Kalinda on that. And I don't know anybody else who's saying this in an organization. And if they are, they're not accurate on that. It is a movement though. And we need to stop denying that it, that, that it's not a movement because it is, it's being acknowledged on paper as of 2019, my goodness, as of 2020, 2021, it's being acknowledged. So I think the first thing is admitting we have a problem. Isn't that the first <laughs> st step here is admitting we have a problem so we can deal with it and not just whitewash it or act like it doesn't exist or just basically say, well, everybody who says something negative about it or wants to talk about it, they're just a conspiracy theorist. I'm just going to, I'm going to move on <laughs> off my soapbox a bit. Also too, I wanted to say that Peter Wagner in this same service, he had this to say about apostles and authority. Because you can't talk about apostles without his authority. So I want to camp on this word authority a little bit and make sure we understand where this authority uh, comes from. Now, Paul gives us a short answer. But I want, I want to go to a longer answer. First, I'll give you the short answer, which really sums it all up. And that is in uh, 2 Corinthians 10.8. Now, that's, that's that same scripture, same verse, excuse me, same chapter I quoted before. Remember where Paul said he boasted of his authority? Remember that one? A boast of my authority? Now, this is a few verses later, same chapter. Look what he said. He says, for even if I should boast somewhat about our authority, which he did earlier in the chapter. Look, see the comma there? Which the Lord gave us. For edification, not for your destruction. I shall not be ashamed. See where the where does the authority come from? The Lord. It's not his authority. He didn't generate it. The Lord gave him his authority. Okay? That's the short answer. Now let me give you a, a little a few more details on this. Okay. First of all, here are four more specific sources of authority. Uh, apostles have the spiritual gift of apostle. Now, like I said, First Corinthians twelve is the most detailed chapter on spiritual gifts. And um, here's just, I just pulled this out because this is where apostles come up. And look what he says in 1 Corinthians 12, 29. Are all apostles, what's the obvious answer? No. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Are all workers of miracles? Do all speak with tongues? I interpret that as having a special gift of messages in tongues. Do all interpret? No. And um, so, but what I'm saying is that in lists of spiritual gifts, apart from Ephesians 4, 11, Apostles come right in the list of gifts, okay? And let me ask you a question. Who decides what gifts you get? Yeah, do you decide it? Do you look it up in the catalog and see which ones you're going to order? No. God decides what. So it's your responsibility not to get the gift. It's your responsibility to find out what gift God's given you, discover the gift, and then develop it and use it because you're a certain member of the body of Christ. And um, uh, so that's number one. That's where apostles... Then when, when those who have the spiritual gift of apostle, part and parcel of that gift is a great deal of authority. Another source is they have a divine assignment or call. I'll stop right there. I will have the link to all of these things below so that you can look at them for yourself. But uh, I just have a question here, taking all of this into consideration. Does all of this sound like a mere academic purpose? I want you to consider that question again. And if that is the case, ignoring what I just shared with you, how does Daniel Kalinda explain what took place at Lakeland in June of 2008 with Todd Bentley's commissioning? Because he cites that the whole NAR conspiracy started, it originated in 2011. But we actually can need to back up a little bit to a few years before that because um, there is some video footage that would negate his claims that the NAR is a conspiracy theory that was concocted by the liberal media. We have proof from Lakeland. Have a listen. If you haven't heard it before, it may be a little different for you. My name is Peter Wagner, and I'm president of Global Harvest Ministries based in Colorado Springs, Colorado. I have served the body of Christ in apostolic ministry for many years, and currently I preside over the International Coalition of Apostles, which brings together over 500 recognized apostles. I have the honor of being assigned to preside over this momentous occasion, and I am humbled as I approach the task with an enormous sense of awe. Holy Spirit, I invite your presence, your power, and your direction. Amen? 
Now, also on the stage, I want to quickly note, I can't see everybody on there, but you, you can see on the video that Rick Joyner's on there, Shayon, Bill Johnson, um, Chuck Pierce was not able to be there, but he did ship his own anointing oil to use for the commissioning of Todd Bentley. There are several leaders that are on there, uh, John Arnott. So there are multiple people there, and you're about to hear something that they relate to the apostles in scripture for this particular commissioning service. This is a ceremony celebrating the formal apostolic alignment of Todd Bentley. I want to There's that word alignment. Use the experience that Paul had on that occasion as the text for the protocol for tonight's alignment and commissioning of Todd Bentley. It is found in Galatians 2.9, which tells the story of one of Paul's visits to Jerusalem. It says, and when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Todd is following Paul's example by inviting to the platform three apostolic pillars of today's church. Cheon of Pasadena, California, Bill Johnson of Reading, California, and John Arnott of Toronto, Canada, Todd's native land. I have a question for the three apostles. Do you perceive the grace of God given to Todd Bentley? As an evangelist to lead the Lakeland outpouring, I have a question for Todd Bentley. Do you recognize the apostolic authority of these three men in your life and ministry? And do you desire to establish an apostolic alignment with them and with Revival Alliance? With this affirmation, we will move to a formal commissioning, equivalent to offering the right hand of fellowship as the three apostles did to Paul in Jerusalem. This commissioning represents a powerful spiritual transaction taking place in the invisible world. With this in mind, I take the apostolic authority that God has given me, and I decree to Todd Bentley, your power will increase, your authority will increase, your favor will increase, your influence will increase, your revelation will increase. I also decree that a new supernatural strength, strength will flow through this ministry, a new life force will penetrate this move of God. Government will be established to set things in their proper order. God will pour out a higher level of discernment to distinguish truth from error. New relationships will surface to open the gates for the future. So they go on to commission him, Cheon, Bill Johnson, and John Arnott all pray over him and give him like a prophetic word or such. But we know if you're familiar with Lakeland, you know what happened. So we're not going to get into that. If you don't know, you need to do a little bit of research and you need to look into that because this was, this is a mess. I mean, this, this turned into an absolute mess. There was no discernment in sight whatsoever, what was going on. And this right here is a prime example of what they viewed as apostolic authority. So I want you to note that. I want you to note the authority assumed by professing modern day apostles. Bill Johnson is noted as an apostle. He's standing on a platform with Shayon, John Arnott, Rick Joyner, Peter Wagner. <laughs> and I'm sorry, but it just, it seems, it, it's just very, again, very frustrating when you hear people say, I don't know what the NAR is. But then you've, you've had these people stand on stage with Peter Wagner. They know what it is. They know what it is. Stop it. <laughs> I just want to say stop it. Um, I want you to note the comparison to three apostolic pillars of today's church to those noted in Galatians 2 when dealing with Paul. You know, it is puzzling to me how there are people who say, well, there's no there's no apostles today that believe that they are like the 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 apostles of Christ, like the 12 and like Paul. But yet they want to make the comparison to that particular for that example in Galatians 2. In this particular instance, they make the correlation with that. It seems like there's a, a, a something's lost in translation here. I mean, it makes perfect sense if you are comparing that in Galatians 2 to the Lakeland commissioning, then one could deduce from that that you're comparing apples to apples, meaning that you think that you have you're like a first century apostle that had the governing authority. And that's the premise of the new apostolic reformation. It's not just in people that believe in apostles and prophets today. And there are people that make the distinction, even in scripture, that there are different types of apostles. There were apostles that were not the apostles of Christ that were commissioned by Jesus himself. They were apostles to the church, for example, like Barnabas, Andronicus, a few others that are mentioned. 
why don't they compare themselves to those apostles? If they're saying that they're not like the ones, and, and let's not forget, multiple times in these books, they keep saying, restore, restore. We're going to, rest, God's restoring the apostles. He's restoring the prophets. In Peter Wagner's book, um, Dominion, I believe, that uh, was republished, by the way, I don't want to get ahead of myself. He said in that book, in one of the first chapters, he said in the 70s that, that they finally acknowledged, that they started acknowledging the office of the intercessor, that the intercessor was restored. Then in the 80s, the prophet was restored. And then in the 90s, that's when the apostle was restored. But if you want to, rest and I said this before in another episode, but to restore means it's not continuation. There's a difference between continuation and restoring. If you believe in the restoration of the apostles and prophets, then you want them put back in their original condition, meaning that they had governing authority. Contrary to what some people may say, there are people that actually believe that they have governing authority over you. And if you question them, then they'll strip you of titles. They'll they'll basically make an example out of you and they will make it to, they'll put you back in a corner and put you in a position to where you have no other option but to leave. And they will demonize you and they will say all kinds of things about you before you leave and then after you leave because you went against the grain and you questioned. This is not just me speaking from personal experience. This is a story that is told time and time and time again by many other people. It may change the scenery. It may change the individual who's calling themselves an apostle. But nevertheless, the, the narrative is still the same. And people are being damaged because of this movement. And they're being damaged when people come out like Daniel Kalinda, and he's making these broad blanketed statements, which he doesn't like being done to them. So now he's going to do it to those of us that call things into question. When you make blanketed statements and you tell people this movement's nonsense, that it doesn't exist, that it's just a conspiracy theory, that you all are just Illuminati conspiracy theorists and you're heresy hunters and you sit in your parents' basement and eat Cheetos all day and play video games, then you're sticking your head in the sand and you're denying the fact that people are being spiritually abused. And it's not right. It's not right. I'm, I'm more bothered and grieved over the fact when I hear other people. I got over the fact of what I went through personally. What really was heartbreaking to me was coming out of this and then hearing other people reach out to me and sharing what they went through. And there were people that also that were affiliated with Ryan, by the way, that were damaged and devastated. I mean, you talk, you ever heard the rise and fall of Mars Hill and the part where Mark Driscoll talks about the, the, the recording of him talking about getting people and taking them off the bus because they just didn't want to sit in the seat and be quiet. Or, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but basically said there's a lot of dead bodies or a lot of bodies behind the bus that you just keep going over them. Well, it's kind of like that. And that's not an isolated incident. The sad fact is, is that there's many of this going all over the place and people are being abused spiritually. There are people walking away from the faith and we can have a whole other discussion about that. Whether people truly were in the faith, whether they were false converts, whatever happened with them and that maybe they never even heard the gospel to begin with, which is even sadder, but it's devastating and it's heartbreaking and it's not okay to do that. And if I have to be a voice to say that, then I'm going to. I'm going to stand up and I'm going to say, it's not okay to do that to people. You need to consider what's being said. Don't brush it off and just say, oh, you're just a heresy hunter and you just don't like the charismatic and you're just jealous. There's nothing to be jealous of when there's this type of abuse going on. And I, don't, I do not envy the leaders that are going to have to be accountable for what they've done in beating the flock that belongs to God. I don't envy that one bit. I don't envy the false signs and wonders. I don't envy the goosebumps. I don't envy any of that. What I want to see is people come to repentance. I want to see people come to reconciliation in Christ and to really know the true gospel and to understand true biblical discipleship, true biblical discernment, true spiritual warfare, and true power in Christ and true freedom in Christ. That is the quote campaign that I'm on. God has laid upon at my feet to help other women do this. That's the campaign, if you want to call it that. that that's, the, that's the journey that I'm on. And all the glory to God. For, for every bit of it um, when people are turned back to Christ in the right way. So I want you to note this in this Lakeland clip. 
that there is this authority assumed and they're using an example from Galatians 2 9. So, you know, I could say you could easily say compare apples to apples. I would also like to know how individuals like Daniel Kalinda would explain what took place at Bethel in June of 2020 when Bill Johnson, Shayon, Ed Silvoso, and others stood on the platform with a wooden staff reenacting the scene from Lord of the Rings to take apostolic authority over racism. You know, we're going to do some binding and loosening. And one of the things that I've learned in the last maybe around 10 years, that apostles have authority to make the decrees and declaration and um, and something that God gives. And I've seen it work in so many practical ways. Well, Pastor Marlene got a prophetic vision right before this event. And she saw us doing a prophetic act that was going to be very, very historic. So thank you for hanging in there. So I'm going to ask us right now to all grab a hold of this in our hand, every single one of us. But from the Father right here, we are going to lift the staff and we will command the Spirit not only to leave, but he shall not pass. Now, if you heard what Apostle Savosa said, he said that you need to oil your door. So I encourage you, if you haven't done this in the proper order, you must put oil in your door and then go in front and repeat this act with us. That the spirit of racism may leave your house, whether you participated as a victim or as someone who did it. We all did it. For a country to be where it is right now, we all did it. But we will say together, no more, no more, no more. So on the count of three. Oh, I'm sorry. We have to sit. Well, two things. I think it's important for you to share the vision of Gandalf, putting the stake down because that. that, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm not going to share that. I'm going to jump ahead. Is what we are talking about that can only be released by an apostolic decree. The authority must be given. And that's why I revealed what we heard tonight. So is that clear? So please stand up with us. So if you could stand because you're standing in authority because you're all kings and priests and all of us, we're an apostolic people. So as an apostolic team with the authority that God's given to us, we decree and declare that racism will end. It's over in the ecclesia from this night forward in Jesus mighty name. Let's lift it up and bang it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on, give it a praise over. I'm sorry, we did it twice. We need one more. One more. We need you to agree with us. Okay. On the count of three. On three. Shout with us. One, two, three. Thou shalt not pass. The name of Jesus Christ. Who knew that Gandalf was an apostle? I had no idea. I have to find some comedy in there. Forgive me. It just, it just has to come out because otherwise it's just, it's just so sad and it's frustrating to hear these things. Um, I also want to draw your attention to the repub- to the republication of Peter Wagner's book, Dominion. Yes, it's been republished and it was republished last month. In my research and going through here, I came across this. Destiny Image actually republished this book by Peter Wagner. I have it in my possession. Because of the fact, I felt like it was significant that they republished one of his works called Dominion, Your Role in Bringing Heaven to Earth. Now, the subtitle was different on the original one, but the new one says Your Role in Bringing Heaven to Earth. And originally it was done in 2008. But before we get to Peter Wagner's book, Dominion, that's been republished as of last month, we are going to listen to a few clips that deal with Dominion. So you can kind of hear in Peter Wagner's own voice and his own words what he means by Dominion. And then you're going to hear another clip from another well-known leader that's currently around today named Dutch Sheets. What I'm getting ready to play for you was recorded back in January of 2008 at Chuck Pierce's Glory of Zion International. It was called Starting the Year Off Right. Uh, both Peter Wagner and Dutch Sheet spoke at this, and these are clips that I came across and wanted to share with you. So let's have a listen to that. Which brings us to the Dominion Mandate. <laughs> now, uh, first of all, I want to point out these two words, Dominion and Mandate. The word Mandate, you've got to understand, Mandate means an authoritative order or command. It doesn't mean a good idea. It doesn't mean a suggestion. It means an authoritative order. Dominion 
has to do with control. Dominion has to do with rulership. Dominion has to do with authority and subduing. And it relates to society. Dominion means being the head and not the tail. Domin dominion means ruling as kings. It says in Revelation chapter 1, 6 that he has made us kings and priests. And check the rest of that verse. It says for dominion. Jesus delegated establishing his kingdom to us. What do I mean? To you and to me. We are the ones who are, the, who are supposed to bring this about. You see, Jesus tra trained his disciples to take charge after he left. Go ahead and put the first map up on the screen, if you would. What you're about to hear is Dutch Sheets. It just switched over to Dutch Sheets. He's going to be showing a map, which I know you can't see on the podcast, but it's a map of the United States. And he has dots all over it, blue dots that indicate the apostolic networks. There's a dot in every single state in the United States. And there's smaller uh, black dots that indicate individuals. Listen to what he has to say about this. Tell me that this is not dealing or that he doesn't understand um, what new apostolic reformation is. These are just circles. The blue circles represent apostolic networks. We have them all over the nation now. I'm just dealing with America. They're all over the world. We have them all over America. The black dots represent individuals. There is an awesome apostolic grid. There's an apostolic prophetic grid. There's an apostolic prophetic intercession declaration grid over America. We are positioned now to do anything he wants to do. And they're out there. Believe me, they're everywhere. There are apostles in the military. There are apostles in government. There are prophets in government. There are apostles and prophets in the media. They are there in entertainment. They are there in education. You have no idea what God is about to unleash on this nation. In case you're wondering, that would be in reference to the Seven Mountain Mandate, because he just mentioned some of the names of the mountains that are in reference. He didn't say mountains, but those are the names of the mountains that he referenced. Education, arts and media, entertainment. I mean, it's it's pretty evident. So now that we've talked about that, let's transition over into Peter Wagner's book called Dominion. The first chapter is called A New Wine, The Second Apostolic Age. So I wanted to read a few things to you from that chapter, beginning on page 21. He talks about the, the Second Apostolic Age at the bottom of page 20 and says we are now in the Second Apostolic Age. And on page 21, under a subheading called A Massive Movement, he says, still, it is important to know up front that this is a massive movement. Again, it's not an organization. It's a movement. Recognized widely by sociologists of religion and by church historians and by other scholars as well. For example, one of our most, most respected researchers, David Barrett, author of the massive World Christian Encyclopedia, has divided world Christianity into five mega blocks, the largest of which is Roman Catholicism, with over one billion members. However, of the four non Catholic mega blocks, the New Apostolic Reformation, which he calls Neo Apostolic, or independent or post-denominational is the largest with over 432 million adherents compared to smaller numbers for the Protestant slash evangelical Orthodox and Anglican megablocks. These neo-apostolics comprised only 3% of non-Catholic Christianity in 1900, but they are projected to include almost 50% by 2025. But this is not a movement. Don't even say that. It's not a movement. It's a conspiracy theory. It's not real. It's been made up. You just need to stop saying that. Whoever's saying that this is a movement, you need to stop because it's not real. That's what we're, be that's what we're being told. That's what we're being told. Not only is the New Apostolic Reformation, this is again, I'm, comp I'm continuing on in the book. Not only is the New Apostolic Reformation the largest of the four non-Catholic mega blocks, but significantly enough, it is the only one of all five that is growing faster than Islam. Uh, Wagner goes on to say in this same subheading, the roots of the New Apostolic Reformation can be traced back as far as 1900 when the African Independent Church movement was first launched. The Chinese House Church movement beginning around 1975 and the Latin American Grassroots Church movement emerging around 1980 were parts of the same spiritual phenomenon on different continents. In the U.S., the independent charismatic churches dating back to around 1970 were the most immediate precursors of what is now called the New Apostolic Reformation. Reformation. On page 23 of chapter 1, called the new, A New Wine, the Second Apostolic Age, Peter Wagner says, quote, In fact, here in the United States, the genealogy of the New Apostolic Reformation is traced through the independent charismatic churches, then back through classic Pentecostalism, and finally to the Azusa Street Revival. 
On page 24, which is the last page I'm going to read, this is a fairly thicker book. Um, it says on page 24 in the same chapter, uh, Peter Wagner says, The gift and office of prophet began to be affirmed by the body of Christ in the decade of the 1980s. He talked about 1970s, the intercessor, which I've already mentioned this a few minutes ago. He actually recognized and said others did too of the office of intercessor, which is not found in scripture. It also goes on to say the decade of the 1990s saw the beginning of the recognition of the gift and office of apostle in today's church. True, many Christian leaders do not as yet believe that we now have legitimate apostles on the level of Peter or Paul or John, but a critical mass of the church agrees that they are here. I'm confused because I'm hearing people say that there are people that don't believe that they're the same as these apostles, and yet Peter Wagner, who's being cited in these books, even currently I'm holding the 22 republished version of this book, Dominion that Peter Wagner wrote. Destiny Image put it out. Destiny Image is one of the big publishing houses for people in this type of movement. I'm sorry, but I'm going to call it what it is. It's a movement, the apostolic prophetic movement, such they gravitate towards these authors. So they're republishing this. And Peter Wagner is saying that Christian. there's many Christian leaders that do not as yet believe that we now have legitimate apostles on the level of Peter or Paul or John. But a critical mass of the church agrees that they are here. For example, at this writing, the International Coalition of Apostles. Now, they changed the name of it to ICAL, International Coalition of Apostolic Leaders. They changed that when he died. And they've taken stuff off his website. A few months ago, I did the, is apostolic governance a myth? And I want to say it was a matter of days. I had looked on there, found the definition of apostle. They had some of Peter Wagner's stuff on there. I, I could cite it to you. It, it was talking about the second apostolic age. They now have removed that. And I noted that on my podcast, on the episode. But he says in here, at the writing of the International Coalition of Apostles, over which I preside for 10 years, includes over 500 members who mutually recognize and affirm each other as legitimate apostles. And they believe, he and he did, that they were on the same level as the apostles of Christ. Which means that they believe they have governing authority over the church. And they're establishing apostolic networks. You heard it with your own ears. He, he said this. It's in the books written. It's in the books that other people are writing. They are perpetuating this. They are regurgitating it. The, the apostolic networks or freedom outposts or revival hubs are supposed to replace the denominations. But they don't want to take over. No. And, you know, the whole seven mountain mandate is just it's nonsense to be upset about that because nobody, nobody in that is trying to say that they want to take over the world, that they want to take over these areas and that, that there's no spiritual warfare involved in that. What are you talking about? I would encourage you to read Johnny Inlow's book about the seven mountain mandate prophecy. And see if you come back from reading that book of seeing that he's talking about spiritual warfare and that there's um, that there are demonic principalities assigned to each mountain and that there's certain ap there are apostles that are in these different uh, mountains of influence that need to take over those mountains so that we can bring Christ back and we can throw and we can destroy and annihilate the beast and the false prophet. That's in that book. I've read it. I have it. I own it. <laughs> it's there. So. Th this stuff is true. There are people that that in within these these areas that are seemingly identified in this movement and people that are sitting in the services that, for example, in 2015, Jeff Jansen was in that room. Dutch Sheets was in that room. Um, I don't know who else was in that room of leaders that would be known. Now it's being said that they didn't agree with his terminology. Well, why wasn't that made clear at any point in time? Why wasn't that made clear? Instead, it seems like it's being agreed with and the verbiage is changing, but it's still, I mean, you, you can put a, li you can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. And so you can try to change the, the terminology all you want, but it's still pointing back to what Peter Wagner coined. And because, and we know that because they're citing it in, in their books. This all leads to some thoughts and questions I want to pose to you in addition to one or two I've already posed. If today's apostles are not likened to the 12 and Paul, why are teachings pointing back to them as the example? I've already mentioned that. Why not use Barnabas as the standard of apostleship? I've already mentioned that, but these are worth mentioning again to get you thinking about this. Many are sharing personal experiences in affirming their call to apostleship. A prime example is Brian Simmons. 
on the Sid Roth program, Brian Simmons, who is the lead translator for the Passion Translation, he um, talks about, he recounts this um, experience that he had in his house where Jesus Christ, he said, walked through the, the wall, came into his room and breathed on him and commissioned him to write the Passion Translation. That sounds awfully familiar to what happened to the disciples in, in John 20. When Jesus is, after he's resurrected, he comes back to them and he breathes on him and says, receive the Holy Spirit. And that's just one example. I mean, there are other examples that you can find that people that claim apostleship or prophets, even that they claim these radical, fantastical experiences and encounters, these divine supernatural encounters that look awfully similar to ones that we find in scripture that the, that the apostles of Christ experienced and that the prophets experienced. There's a lot of these that, that they're make. it seems like you can make a correlation with that. And so it seems like that they're sharing these personal experiences and affirming their apostleship and the experiences most certainly parallel those of the apostles of Christ many times. If the NAR is not a movement or if it's not real, then why republish one of Wagner's books that explicitly states what it does about the new apostolic reformation? People can make the argument, well, I can cite some of Wagner's stuff, but we don't have to agree with everything. But when you read that book on Dominion, there's a lot of stuff in there that is that is concerning. And when he starts talking about the new apostolic reformation and talking about open theism and workplace apostles about how people need to be uh, be a workplace apostles and they need to form a government within the workplace and, and yeah it's not real guys it's not real it's all your imagination it's all your imagination some of us have taken note that organizations once affiliated with wagner as he founded them such as ical and uh, U us cal is united states coalition of apostolic leaders are attempting to make revisions on their sites and to remove some of Wagner's statements concerning the NAR. There is some acknowledgement, it seems, of error once taught and abuses in assumed apostolic authority. However, and I'm going to use the word however, they still hold to the belief of a second apostolic age and dominion theology. And I wanted to I actually have this printed in front of me. This is from the United States Coalition of Apostolic Leaders straight off of their website. This is a uh, an article that Joseph Matera wrote called the NAR and the Restoration of Apostolic Ministry Today, Part 2. And in this article that was posted on April 22nd, 2018, that is still available on the site, he talks about that the present embrace of the fivefold ministry of the evangelical pastors in the USA is going to bring a convergence between the charismatic independent apostolic networks, evangelical networks, and ultimately even evangelical Bible confessing denominations. And the implications of this will be extraordinary. Mr. Matera says, he says, the church will go from being pastorally led to apostolically led and prophetically inspired. This emerging apostolic paradigm will shift the missionary focus from planting local churches to planting movements of churches and Christ followers that will permeate every facet of society, which I am not against us as Christians influencing, having a, an influence, a positive influence on society, a godly influence on society. But to have like an over, almost an over-realized eschatology that everything's going to be unicorns and rainbows and that everybody's going to get along and there's not going to be poverty and there's not going to be crime and there's not going to be murder and there's not going to be sin before Christ comes back and everything is, is completed, that's fantasy land. And to have this, again, over-realized eschatology. But we should be influencing. We should be a, a, a godly and a positive influence as Christians, which I will also say this, by the way, when you read these books, these apostolic teachings and such, what you will find them say too, including Peter Wagner said this, that the Great Commission cannot be fulfilled unless apostles are restored. And the apostles that they're talking about are equivalent to the ones in the first century, which were the apostles of Christ. You just heard me read that in the Dominion book that Peter said that, you know, there's some leaders that believe that there's not many believe that there's not um, the same type of apostles as Peter, John and Paul today. But there's masses that are starting to believe that they are here. So they do believe on all the lines of that because it's the apostolic paradigm. Uh, Mr. Matera says the apostolic paradigm will shift the focus from gathering crowds on Sunday to developing disciples who will manifest the reign of Christ from Monday to Saturday. The present apostolic paradigm will restore the church back to the way of Christ and his apostles. The present apostolic paradigm will bring a course correction to the new apostolic reformation and view the apostolic as a ministry function, not an office, as an adjective, not a title. I would say good luck with that. Good luck with that.
because there are people that really do view themselves in that hierarchy, which he addresses. And I appreciate that he's addressing this, but in these, in this article, but nevertheless, He's acknowledging there is a, a movement called the NAR, that it is real, there, and there are issues. I appreciate that. But at the same time, there are still some concerning things that are being taught here, some, some beliefs and such. Um, number six, he says, the present apostolic paradigm will correct the autocratic top-down hierarchical government of many in the NAR and mimic the servant leadership of style of Jesus who came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And it continues to go on. I can post the link to this as well in case you want to read that. I want to provide all the information, all the sources that I use for fairness and objectivity. So in closing, <laughs> and I appreciate you hanging with me. This has been a longer podcast than normal, but I appreciate you hanging with me. This is important information for you to consider, especially if you've come out of this movement and you're hearing someone tell you that the NAR is not real and it's a conspiracy theory and all this other stuff. For those that are listening I lovingly say this to you. <laughs> if you're listening to this and you still don't believe in the NAR or you are saying still believing, well, you're just you're just jealous and you're just a heresy hunter and you just don't have better things to do with your time. Um, you can call me a conspiracy theorist. You can call me silly. You can call me a hypercritic, nonsensical and any other colorful adjective you want. One thing you will not call those of us who have spent time researching this and doing our homework is uninformed. And not knowing what we're talking about. Because I've heard people, including the apostle I sat under, saying that people that talk about this don't know what they're talking about. Because you see, I've read these books. Others of us have read these books. I sat under teaching for years about the new wineskin, apostles and prophets being the government of God, the fivefold ministry, the power of alignment, and other associated teachings. I've taken time to listen to hours of these teachings and to read books about them. Others have as well, as I said. And saying this movement is nonsense and denying the mountain of evidence, not to be confused as one of the seven mountains referred to by Wagner and Dominionism, by the way, is gaslighting. And that's what is going on right now. It's gaslighting. Plain and simple. It is insensitive to those who have been confronted by people believing themselves to be apostles and being spiritually abused by these apostles. And respectfully, it makes those who say such things look like they don't know what they're talking about. And to use ad hominem attacks while telling critics they do the same is a severe lack of self-awareness with a heavy dose of hypocrisy. The truth of the matter is there are many people holding to Wagner's teaching, perpetuating Wagner's teaching, and are fully invested in the restoration of apostles and prophets for governing authority because some of these people want power and they want control and they want to be idolized. He was allowed to take ministry platforms and teach this. Wagner's books are being republished, perpetuating this currently. His teachings are being adopted even if people try and sidestep association with the New Apostolic Reformation or claim they do not know what it is because they don't have an actual card in their wallet to say that they are an apostle. As for apostles and prophets, the foundation has already been laid according to Ephesians 2.20. A building only needs one foundation. And if the foundation is still being laid, how can the church be built on an unfinished foundation? I believe in the fivefold. The apostles are still ministering today through the written word of God. We are doing what those in Acts 2.42 were doing. We are submitting ourselves to the apostles' teachings that are found in Scripture. The prophets are still ministering today through the written word of God. Scripture is apostolic and prophetic. The gospel is prophetic and foretelling of the good news that can only come through faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for our sins and to give us the promise of eternal life. The evangelist pastors and teachers are ministering today and helping to fulfill Ephesians 4, 11 through 12 alongside the word of God containing the teachings and the, the prophetic words of the apostles and prophets. The fivefold is active today. I am not sure why this biblical train of thought is not acceptable. I'm sure that there will be more denial of this movement and more semantics played when it comes to the NAR. And there needs to be more open dialogue and honest scrutiny done with regards to the New Apostolic Reformation. As for me, I'm going to resume wearing my tinfoil hat and going back to the basement. Until next time, y'all, be blessed today by the truth of God's Word. Thank you for joining me on this podcast. If you would like to connect with me, you can find me on Facebook and on Instagram at lovesickscribe. And if you enjoy reading, feel free to hop on over to lovesickscribe.com and subscribe to my blog. I've enjoyed being with you today, and I look forward to our next time together as we talk about biblical truths, current topics, 
and we continue to grow together in loving the Word and loving the one who is the Word, Jesus Christ. Blessings to you.